In this video, we are actually going to look at how nerve impulses are created uh, and sent down the axon and also jump from neuron to neuron. So in order to understand exactly how impulses work, we need to kind of understand the setup that allows impulses to occur. What you have to keep in mind is that all living cells have a polarized cell membrane. In other words, we have a very much like a polar molecule in chemistry. It ha we have um, some charge differentials taking place across the cell membrane. In other words, we have positive and negative charges that are actually separated by the cell membrane, which we refer to as the membrane potential. This membrane potential exists in every single cell in our body, but only two systems can actually take advantage of this, our neurons and our muscle cells. This allows a feature of both of these called excitability. And excitability is basically the ability of these cells to respond to environmental changes. In neurons, this is what creates an impulse or action potential. In muscle cells, this is what allows them to contract, which we will talk about with the muscular system. Now, this excitability within neurons permits the movement of an electrochemical impulse. So it's a combination of electricity and chemical compounds. Sometimes we will refer to this impulse as an action potential as well. So let's look a little bit further at this resting membrane potential. This resting membrane potential occurs when the neuron is not doing anything. It's resting. If I look at it, the outer surface is positive and the inner surface is negative. So if I look at this, I have my cell membrane here. And the charges actually line up right along the membrane. So I have my positives along the outside, and then I will have my negatives lined up along the inside. And that's how the resting potential is actually set up. So how do we create this setup? First of all, we separate the electrical charges. We have to keep them apart, and that's what the cell membrane does for us. The way that this difference, though, is created is because of ion concentrations. So let's take a look at the ions that are involved. Outside of the cell, we have sodium as our positive ion, and inside, it's potassium. We also have to have some negatives involved here because we have two different charges. So on the outside, we have chloride, and on the inside, we have proteins. So in both the outside and inside of the cell, we have positive and negatives, and it's the balance between how many sodiums versus chlorines and how many potassium versus proteins that set up this differential. Now, if we look at what happens when resting potential, this potassium leaks out very easily into the outside of the cell. Sodium likes to leak into the cell, but it does it slower. It's not as easy for the sodium to leak in. Proteins are too large, and very rarely are they going to pass through. So the, the negative ions actually don't tend to move. It's the sodium and potassium that we look at. So then what happens is the sodium has to move out, and the potassium has to move in. And because we're going against the concentration gradient, this has to happen via active transport. We have to expend energy in order to do this, because this is not the way that they want to flow. However, this is crucially important because we need to do this in order to maintain the membrane potential. So, this mechanism is controlled by a specialized protein called the sodium-potassium pump. And what happens is, for every three sodium ions that we push out of the cell, two potassium ions get pulled in. And this creates a net negative charge on the inside of the cell and a net positive charge on the outside. Now, this next part here, we have a video clip. Now, I can't post it here simply because of copyright regulations, but I do have this available on my Moodle page um, if you would like to see it. Simply go to my Palmyra Moodle site and then all you need to do is, um, it will be active for you, 
and you can go ahead and view that video. So, as a result of the sodium potassium pump, what you should have learned, hopefully if you watched the video clip, is that we actually get a setup here with our cell membrane, okay, and on the inside, the main ion that we are concerned about is potassium. And then on the outside, it is the sodium. And I actually end up with more sodium on the outside than I have potassium on the inside, which creates that positive versus negative. So this is the basic setup before we do anything to the cell in terms of an impulse. So now let's take a look at how this resting membrane potential changes. My computer's a little slow here, sorry. What changes it is called a stimulus. What a stimulus does is it alters the membrane permeability to sodium or potassium. It also shuts down, so in other words, it alters the functioning of the sodium potassium pump. This is what is going to disturb the resting potential of the cell. So a stimulus can be anything like chemical exposure, pressure, a change in temperature, or a change in ion concentration outside of the cell. So when this stimulus occurs, we basically have two different channels that can open. In the first option, we can open up sodium channels that were closed in the membrane. This causes sodium to move into the cell, and it actually starts to change the electrical charges in the membrane. Eventually, it's going to get to the point where the charges reverse, so that it's going to become positive on the outside and negative on the inside. And this is the process of depolarization. This next slide has a video clip relating to depolarization and the I ion movement associated with this. This is also located on my Moodle page. So depolarization, we have the sodium channels open and sodium rushes in and the charges reverse. But the other option is that the potassium channels could open up instead. If the potassium channels open, potassium is going to leave the cell and this actually reinforces or increases the membrane potential. So it makes the outside even more positive and the inside even more negative. So that process is called hyperpolarization. So the, the idea is here that we want depolarization to take place in order for an impulse to happen, not hyperpolarization. So what happens next is going to depend on the strength of the stimulus. If it is small, an action potential will not be generated. In other words, I haven't gotten enough of a change in the electrical charges for it to occur. If the stimulus changes the membrane potential enough, the impulse will occur. So this idea that sometimes we get it and sometimes we are not, we don't, depends on a, an idea called threshold. Threshold is a certain level of depolarization that needs to take place in order for the impulse to happen. Any stimulus that delivers the membrane potential to threshold will generate an identical action potential every single time. So it doesn't matter the strength, it just matters whether or not it can get it to threshold. Normal resting membrane potential is about negative 70 millivolts. Threshold is around negative 60. So the idea is we don't have to change the membrane potential a lot in order to get an action potential. This is what we call the all-or-nothing principle or the all-or-nothing response. A stimulus either creates an action potential or none at all. So let's go through the actual steps of an impulse. The first step is that we need to depolarize the membrane to threshold, which we just kind of talked about. We have to get that certain level of depolarization to take place. Then we get a further increase, a very rapid depolarization, because basically all of the sodium channels are going to snap open. 
So here you can see on this diagram we get some depolarization of the membrane and once we reach threshold we open up the sodium gates and all of the sodium or most of the sodium actually comes in. Once we've done that we actually shut the sodium channels and now we open the potassium channels. So the potassium starts rushing out of the cell. So this is actually going to help change our charges back to normal. And this begins this process of repolarization. Now, however, we do not have our ions back where they need to be for normal resting potential. And that's what happens in step four. The sodium potassium pump kicks back in and restores that arrangement of the sodium on the outside and the potassium on the inside. And we can see that here in this diagram. Okay, the sodium channel here has closed, the potassium has opened, the potassium is now flooding out. Once the sodium potassium pump kicks back in, however, we end up with our ions back on the correct side of the membrane and resting potential is restored. The period from the time that we open the sodium channels until the completion of repolarization is referred to as the refractory period. During the refractory period, the neuron will not generate a new action potential no matter how strong the stimulus. We can actually see this here in this diagram. It's another way to look at it. So we have our neuron here at its resting potential. Step one, we get the depolarization up to threshold. Then, once we reach threshold, we get this very rapid depolarization as the sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the cell. Once we reach a certain level of depolarization, those channels shut and the potassium ones open, starting the process of repolarization in step three. The um, voltage or the, the transmembrane potential is actually going to drop down a little bit actually below negative 70 millivolts as that sodium potassium pump kicks in and restores our levels to normal. You can see on here the refractory period is very clearly marked. It encompasses all of steps 2, 3, and 4. If I have another impulse come in in this 2 millisecond time frame, I won't get a different action potential that is generated. Now, once again, I have an action potential video clip that will be available on my Moodle page. In the next video, what I want to do is I actually want to look at how we propagate, in other words, how we move this impulse down the membrane, and then after that, we'll take a look at how the impulse actually moves from neuron to neuron.